family camp of Emerge and Heroes Will Arise because uh, I think that Paul talks about this similar theme throughout the book of Romans where we have this flesh that is at work around us, but we have who God wants us to be, this spirit man, this spirit woman that is within us to uh, rise up. And I know that that's something that's so difficult for so many of us along the way. In fact, as I've preached through Romans, I've received this question on, on multiple occasions where people say, oh, Jonathan, I, I have trouble knowing as a sinner if I'm following the law or if I'm following the Holy Spirit because sometimes that's a little bit difficult. How do I know when uh, I'm trying to do things in my own power or how do I know if it's the Spirit's power that's at work within me? And I believe as we dig into chapter 7 and chapter 8 that Paul is going to answer those questions for us. But specifically today, I want us to understand the, the workings of sin compared to the workings of the law and also the workings of grace because Paul has been on that subject. And so we're going to look through four, four things, basically, of comparison between how those work. And you might uh, take these things and look at your own life and say, oh, this is why I haven't understood this. So oh, this is why I've been struggling here with this element, with this area. Let's begin in Romans chapter 7. We're going to begin where we left off last week. Let's start in verse 7 of Romans 7. Paul asks this question, what shall we say then? That the law is sin? By no means. Now, um, if, we, if we didn't continue reading and all we knew was what Paul had already said in the book of Romans, we might conclude that the law is evil. Let, let's just Oh, let's, let's kick that thing out of here. No more Ten Commandments, no more Book of Deuteronomy, no more Book of Leviticus. We're, we're just done with that. We've moved on to better things. Uh, but Paul wants to be sure that we know that's not the case. By no means is the law sin. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had said, you shall not covet. In verse 8, but sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all types, all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. Now, we see this role that the law has in the midst of it. In verse 9, I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. I don't want us to be confused here. He's not saying that he was saved and then he lost his salvation when he says I was once alive. Uh, he was saying that it, he just knew life, right? Uh, what he did, he thought that that was fine, the way that he lived his life, but then when he saw the law, he realized what I did is not right. The way that I function is not correct. And so it showed him uh, that he was bad and that he needed to change. So he's not saying I was once alive in the Lord. He was just saying I once had this life. In verse 10, the very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. Did you just hear some of the anger of Paul in that statement? You know, he's dictating this to a man named Tertius. We find that at the very end of the book of Romans. But you can almost see him as he's dictating that verse, you know, with fist clenched. Sin deceived me, and, and it killed me. He's getting wound up right here. And verse 12. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By, by no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. We're going to understand that last verse through and through as we go through these things today. Here's what becomes so evident. Maybe the first thing for you to write down in this first section is that sin is very personal. When we try to understand it, sin attacks at our heart personally. Right? Paul is being very personal here. We, uh, we look through these first few verses, and we want to think about sin as impersonal, but Paul says this, 
if it had not been for the law in verse 7, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin seized an opportunity through the commandment and produced in me covetousness. This is, this is very personal for Paul. This is him just bearing his heart, saying, man, I have struggled with being a coveter. I, I don't know what that looked like for Paul. He was a tent maker, so I don't know if he was comparing his tent that he slept in to other tents that other people slept in. Happens to us today, doesn't it? Absolutely. I don't know if by the time he had traveled all across Europe, if his sandals were nasty and he was looking at other people's sandals and saying, I should get the latest model. I don't know if that's what was in him. He wasn't married. I don't know if he was looking at other people that were happily married and saying, oh, I wish I had that wife. I don't know what he struggled with specifically, but it was a struggle. And sin attacks personally in that way. I, I would like to think of sin in this impersonal way. And uh, in church, I like to think about it this way. Like there's a law, right, that says thou shalt not covet, right? And we use that King James terminology because that's not personal, right? Thou shalt not covet. And I would like to say that in my life, I'm walking along and there's the sign. This is covetousness right here. I'm going to go this way. Thank you, God, for thou shalt not covet. That's just not what happens, is it? No, the times that I've coveted, it's come from within, right? Because sin gets us in our heart. It attacks us on a very personal level to where by the time that I realize, well, I'm, I'm coveting, I'm already in it, right? Uh, my, my heart's already committed to it. And, and by that time, when I realize that I'm coveting, then suddenly I don't want to stop coveting because that's the nature of how sin gets us. It starts in my heart. I'm the one that wrestles with the decisions. I'm the one that wrestles personally with the consequences. But when we see sin as personal, what do we see of the law too? We see that the law is also personal. And the law defines our sin. It, it's like a mirror, right, that's gazing into our hearts. Now, I, I can let the law be unpersonal, and I can let the law judge you all day long. That's called being a Pharisee. I enjoy that more, right? It's more fun to be a Pharisee to say, oh, yeah, that person covets. Oh, coveter, right? That's what, that's what we're inclined to do, to, to keep it impersonal, keep it away from my heart. But that's not the intent of the law. The intent of the law is to look inside of you, 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 right? To look inside of you and say, yeah, Jonathan, that's coveting. Ouch. Yeah, Jonathan, that's lusting. Ouch. Yeah, Jonathan, that's, uh, that's lying. Ouch. That's what it does. It looks into our heart and convicts us. Now, here's the good news. When we look at grace, grace is also personal. And grace attacks that sin at the very heart and conquers it. It conquers our sin. Now, in the same way that we look at the law and we look at sin, we try to think of grace as impersonal, don't we? And, the, and you don't tell me that you don't struggle with this because sometimes people will say, oh, yeah, that grace is working for them, but I'm still struggling and I'm still stuck, right? And, oh, they need God's grace because they're extra bad, right? And we try to make it impersonal, but the truth of the matter of God's grace is that it wants to dig into who you are, into your heart, into that thing that you're struggling with, and uproot that thing from your heart. You, you've been coveting your whole life. It wants to get to the bottom of that covetousness and, and bring it up and replace it with the joy of the Lord and His Spirit and His grace. Oh, how amazing grace is. Look with me in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. Another letter that Paul also wrote. In chapter 1 verse 7, Paul says this, in him, that is in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. How personal it is for you by the blood of Jesus conquering your sin. When we look at this list right here, so all three of these are personal. Sin attacking personally, the law pointing out things personally, and grace having victory in your life personally. Now, I like to think of it 
um, in a little bit different way and uh, just kind of helps me remember it. This did not come from me, by the way, so don't, don't hate the messenger. I don't know where it came from. Um, I like to think of grace when I'm shaving because, and women, I'm sorry, this is very manly perspective here, but I'm looking into the mirror and, and the stubble on my chin is the sin, right? And, and I've got to get rid of that sin. And the mirror is identifying that sin. The mirror would be law in this case, okay? As the mirror is just pointing out the sin to me. The mirror is not bad. And of course, we know the mirror doesn't shave us. We're shaved by grace, right? I, I, I apologize in advance. Some of you right now that aren't smiling, tonight you're going to smile when you think about that. I know it's corny, but it's going to help you, all right? Shaved by grace. Who comes up with this stuff anyway? I don't know. Here's the second thing we need to learn about sin, is that sin works through deception. Look with me in Romans chapter 7 and verse 11. You know you're going to be shaven tomorrow. Be like, Man, now I'm excited to shave. Maybe not. Let's keep going. Verse 11, for sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So we know sin works through deception, right? And you might even add doubt and deception. We want to understand sin. It, it uses doubt and deception. Paul said it deceived him. Uh, how is that deception work? Well, he probably thought coveting was good because that's how it works today, Right? Um, of course, that's how it works still today. We think that coveting is good. If I can only have it, then I'm going to be happy. How many of us have struggled with that? And Elizabeth and I both drive cars that have well over 100,000 miles in them, and it's real tempting when we're sitting at a light to look at that brand new um, Ferrari. That's what we look at. Brand new Toyota Sienna, you know, that, that's at the light next to us and say, oh, man, that looks awesome. We need it but our cars run perfectly well. And the only thing that I like more than the thought of having a new car is not having any car payments. Woo, man, praise the Lord. So we stay with our cars. So that's, right, but covetousness, we, we were deceived into thinking, oh, I'm only gonna be happy if I have that, right? Uh, I'm only gonna be happy if I have the newest iPhone. And it's such, such a trap because that happiness fades, doesn't it, the minute that we have it. It just fades. Joy in the Lord is what remains. That's the truth. And it's always good to ask questions, right? How am I coveting? Um, what is coveting like? How can I overcome it? But what we see Satan doing when he works in doubt and deception is that he is questioning God himself. Uh, he's not just asking questions, right? In the Garden of Eden, Satan asked Adam and Eve, did God really say that he's going to do this? We find him doing that in our lives today in doubt and deception to say, is that really bad to covet that? Right? Is, it, is it really bad if you have one more drink? If, is it really bad if you lust? Nobody's going to know that you did this. Right? We, we find him questioning God's standard for us. This is, uh, this is how sin works. Through deception. That's why the law is so important. Here's the second part. The law reveals human nature, and it shows the need for Jesus. It reveals human nature. Now, we're talking about morality, the moral law. When I say the law reveals human nature, you can break the Old Testament law into three categories, into the law for the state of Israel, into the law for sacrifices, and into morality, into the law for morals. Now, what's difficult in the Old Testament is that the three of those are always woven together as it can be. They're not separated biblically. And when the law reveals human nature, we're talking about that morality that still exists. You see, why don't we follow sacrificial law? Because Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. He, he is the sacrifice for us. Why don't we follow the state law of Israel because we're not Israel? We, we have other laws in our nation that we're supposed to follow. You can see these at work um, in the New Testament. In fact, in John chapter 8, we see a, a huge violation of the law. We see this woman caught in the act of adultery. I can't imagine anything more embarrassing than what happened to this woman. 
It seems like literally from the text that she's caught in the act of adultery and she's just grabbed in that act and she's half naked and she's halfway drug, halfway walked through all of the streets, right? People probably yelling, a, a bigger rabble gathering up behind her as she goes through the streets and they bring her down to where Jesus is probably, you always picture him in this quiet, serene moment, maybe teaching his disciples and she's cast down at the foot of Jesus, embarrassed and half naked, caught in the act of adultery and they say, Jesus, the law commands for us to stone this woman, what say you, right? Which, what a trap, because if Jesus would have picked up stones and stoned her, he would have been in trouble by the Roman government because the Jews didn't have authority to stone people that belonged to the government because they were under the statehood of Rome. Right, so you see uh, what I'm talking about here in this state and, and sacrificial law and moral law being at work because adultery is a moral law, isn't it? And it's very uh, obvious in the Ten Commandments. It's a moral law. What she did was wrong, but the issue of stoning her was a state law that's stoned by rocks, not by marijuana. Just some of you were looking at me very strangely. So I just wanted to clarify that right there. What does this law do? Look in verse 10. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. You know what the law does? It testifies that we need Jesus. That's it. It testifies that we need Jesus. It, it helps us see the importance of moving past the law to the grace of Jesus, or we would be stuck in failure. And perhaps that's where you find yourself today, right? But perhaps that's where so much of the church is today. We're stuck in the failure of the law. Right? Oh, I, I'm an adulterer in my heart. Oh, I'm a coveter in my heart. Whatever that might be, I'm stuck there. And if you just allow that law to continue gazing into your heart, you're going to be a failure for the rest of your life. We have to step beyond that law into the grace of Jesus Christ. This is why that's so important. Look at this. Because the grace of Jesus works through his blood. It works through his blood. Going back to that same verse in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, it says this, that in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Right? God's grace wants to be at work in us to give us life. How did it work with that woman that was caught in adultery, right? She's there laid at the feet of Jesus. He says, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. That's a pretty good answer. Shut everybody up really quickly. Um, okay, I'm not going to be the first. You? Would you be the first? Till one by one, they all leave. And then what does Jesus say? Woman, where are your accusers? They've left. And I don't condemn you either. That's grace. That's amazing grace. In grace is found no condemnation. Even where the law has been broken, no condemnation. The ability to get back up on your feet. Now, don't be confused by this, that some people uh, think that grace means you can't identify sin. That's, that's stupidity and ignorance. If you can't identify your sin, that's, that's bad. It's been interesting in my time as a pastor at the church, I've been accused of being a sinner. I've been accused of being too legalistic and I've been accused of having too much grace. All three of the things. One of these can't be accurate at some point or another, right? But we see why in, in this statement right here, because what did Jesus tell that woman? He says, go and sin. He says, I don't condemn you either. And then he doesn't say, go on and commit adultery time and time again. He says, go and sin no more. Right? That's, that's grace at work. You're not in condemnation. Now get up and be the person that I want you to be. We have that opportunity through faith in Jesus Christ, through his blood and the Holy Spirit living in us. Some think grace means overlooking sin. It, it doesn't. It means exactly the opposite of that. 
It means his, his spirit is helping us. One of the best examples of that to me happened when I was in college. Um, I was a music major for my bachelor degree, and I studied piano was my instrument as a music major. And um, in piano, then, you're going to have a professor that you sit one-on-one -on -one with for about an hour and a half a week in our piano lesson as he's teaching me. So, man, we become bonded very, very quickly. It doesn't take a full semester for you to like each other. He, he would have his students over at his house to eat dinner. Um, he was a Christian man. We just really hit it off. He helped me get the first church job that I ever had. Um, well, in the course of my years there at Mary Harden Baylor, I grew to really hate one of the professors that I had to take several times. And I just said, I don't, I don't want any classes with this professor. I, I talked to my piano professor about it, said, I'm going to get, I found this way that I can go to the registrar and I can get out of all the classes that I have with this guy because I can't stand him. He says, Jonathan, I think that's a huge mistake. This is about you becoming a man, man up and take the class and just deal with his personality and your personality. I said, okay, I think about it. And I walked to the registrar and I changed my schedule and I got out of the, all the classes for it. So the next time I go and I sit with my piano professor, he says, you did what? I got news that you did this. I said, I thought I told you not to do that. I said, you did, but I just can't stand the guy. He says, man, I'm really disappointed in you. You made a big mistake. That's going to affect you a long time down the road. You've got to learn how to deal with those problems. He said, I bet before the year is out that you go back to the registrar and you change your schedule for the next semester to be in a class with that guy again. So I'm really upset with you. Now, let's learn about music together. Man, he sat down on that piano bench with me, put his arm around me, start talking through it. Hey, are you still coming over to my house tonight? Let's do that. Oh, what a show of grace for me. He was right. I changed my schedule back. Within the year, um, I manned up, and I'm grateful for it. Grace works through the blood of Jesus to let us be holy in him. Let's look at this third grouping of things. We see that sin is unholy. Look in verse 13. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. Here's what we know, that sin is unholy, that sin is producing death. It's not God. I just want to caution some of us, because I, I hear this in our theology where, where there are people that attribute bad things to God and says, well, God did this. And, and I do understand how our theology can lead us to that conclusion, but the Bible never says that. Right? right? The Bible puts the finger on sin. Now, it does say that God can work through it all, and that's the glory of it. Even in our unholiness as sinners, God can work through us and, and, and create in us through his grace something that is beautiful and that's amazing. But sin is unholy. Uh, how does Satan get us with this deception on sin? Um, he tries to make it look holy, doesn't he? Jonathan, that's really not so bad. He tries to get us to compare ourselves to other people. Look at that person. They're really bad. And you're not, you're just bad. They're really bad. So you're going to be okay, right? That's part of the deception. We convince ourselves that it's not so bad. But sin is black and white. We're in sin or we're not in sin. That's why the law is so important. You see, where sin is unholy, the law is holy. In verse 12, he says, so the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. See, the law is letting us see God's standard. The law is pointing out that sin to us. It reminds us that we are incapable of doing it. The law reminds us, I'm not supposed to compare myself to other people. I'm supposed to compare myself to the holiness of God. That's what the law is there for. Wow, even though I am better than these other people, I am still short of God's glory. And, and I can't do it, right? The law is that reminder that I, I can't do it. And no matter how much I try, I, I end up in failure. So the law is a reminder that I need Jesus. I need grace. I need faith in him to change me from the inside out. That's why grace is so important in this, in this passage right here, because grace leads us to holiness. Where the sin is unholy and the law is holy, grace leads us to that holiness. Look at 2 Timothy, if you will. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9, 
The Bible says of the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy calling. He wants you to be holy, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. By God's purpose, he's calling you to be holy. Grace enables you to be holy. Even Jeremiah said, God wants to write his law upon your heart so that in the same way that covetousness was coming up from your heart, now God's grace and his holiness want to come up from a changed heart by Jesus Christ. Anybody in here ever been to McKinney Falls State Park? And my family, it's, it's one of our favorite places to go. We love to camp there. We love to just take day trips out there. So close, man, right up on I-35 and William Cannon, just a short drive over here. This is a McKinney Falls commercial, by the way. Um, we'll get back to the Bible study in a minute. Um, so we went out there on Friday, and it was before school let out, and our family was one of the only families. There were a few others around, and we're swimming at the Upper Falls. Where the Upper Falls at McKinney Falls, it's about a 10-foot drop, I would say, 10-foot cliff where Onion Creek goes over those rocks and just a beautiful waterfall. So fun because you can jump off of those rocks. You can slide down the waterfall, you know, and just splash around and, and have fun. And Well, we were on a rock below the cliff, and Megan, our daughter, was just looking at the cliff and realized there's a big snake right there in the middle of the cliff. There's a little alcove, and sure enough, the snake and, and, and its head just pointed like this right at us. Well, I couldn't tell if it was a rattlesnake or not, so I had the great idea. I said, well, let's throw things at it until it can move, and we can see its markings better and see if it has a rattlesnake. So we spent about 10 minutes trying to hit the snake and finally hit it and realized, okay, no, it's not a rattlesnake as, as it moved. Well, then we were freaked out. The snake had gotten into our mind. Uh, we didn't really want to get back in the water, but we needed to swim across the water to this hole that you can climb out of this hole and get on top of it. And so I jump in first. The, the kids jump in behind me. We're swimming over to the hole. I get about 10 feet away from the hole, and I kid you not, there is a snake underneath the hole, like slithering up the rock on the hole. So I get like 10 feet, and I turn around. We're swimming away from the snake. We were just chunking rocks at to make it move. And I get to the snake, and I turn around. I said, we got to go back. And they said, no, we're not going back. There's a snake back there. I said, no, we got to go back. They said, what's the matter? Just go back. No, we can't go back. There's a snake. So now we're stuck in this whirlpool of water area where the water's crashing out. There's a snake on either side of us, and the kids are panicking. And I'm, frankly, I'm panicking. Like, I don't want to go either direction either. Tread water for the rest of your lives. You know, that's, that's basically where we're stuck at. Sometimes we can't help but be in the sin, right? Because it's all around us. It surrounds us. It's what we know from, from birth. But sometimes we feel like we're just stuck in that law and in that sin, and we're just going to drown it there. Oh, how grace is so amazing that it has this vantage point of one being on top of the rocks to say, hey, idiots, right? Why don't you swim that direction? There's nothing over there except the beach just to walk up and get out of the water on your own. Well, that's grace that's at work in our lives. It leads us to holiness. You don't have to drown in your sin. You don't have to drown in the failure of keeping up with the law. Grace can walk you to holiness. Let's finish this out. In, in Romans chapter 7, in verses 9 through 11, he says this, Sin seized an opportunity through the commandment. It produced in me all types of covetousness. In verse 9, I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, I, the sin came alive and I died. So here's what we know about sin. Sin produces death. Every time, sin leads to death. You feel like you're tasting death in your life? It's because that's what sin is producing in you. But in the same spoken word, the law works in that sin to provoke sinful reactions. How, how does that work? Look in verse 8. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of sin, right? 
right? As sin takes that law and it produces something that's nasty within us. It's very similar to this principle that if I tell you, hey, I don't want you to think about an elephant right now. What did you just think about? An elephant, right? Some of you, it was pink. Some of it had long ears. Who knows what you, how the elephant looked. It's the same way. When the, when the law says don't covet, because of who we are in our sinful nature, it takes that law and says, oh, yeah, let me do that. That gives me an idea of how I can covet that Satan at work in us in sin. It uses our sinful nature to provoke more sin. But here's what's so beautiful. When Jesus Christ, when his spirit is alive within you, grace is at work within you. Grace works to produce life. Every time, grace works to produce life. Remember a few months ago when we read Romans 5.21, and Paul says this, he says, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Grace produces life every time. Church, don't walk in sin. Walk in grace. Don't walk in law. Walk in grace. Now, it's curious to me as we look at these three things, how sin always starts off looking so good, doesn't it? Lofty promises, it's shiny, that's the deception. But then when you end up at the end of sin, it's always so bad. It's that death syndrome. And it's amazing to me when you look at the law that the law is just a standard of holiness cut across the whole spectrum, right? It never changes. God is who he is yesterday, today, and tomorrow. But if we're honest, grace to us, at first we're a little bit skeptical of it. At first it's a little bit too good to be true, right? That, oh, I don't know if I can walk in this grace. And then we try to walk in grace and we return to the law and we return to our sin. And it's almost like riding a bicycle that we got to get some training wheels on at first with some people that are discipling us. And then they can take our training wheels off where now we're walking in grace on a steady basis. And grace where we might start off skeptical and we might start off not understanding it day after day after day it gets sweeter and sweeter and produces more and more life. That's a story of a God who loves you and who wants to bestow his grace upon you. Father, thank you for this time. Lord, I know what we've talked about can be confusing and we've written down so many things. So sort it out, Lord Jesus, by your Holy Spirit that we could walk in your grace. Uh, We love the way that you love us. When Paul writes another letter, he says, to the praise of the glory of your grace. And we say the same thing, God. Praise you for your glorious grace. How amazing it is. May it rest upon us. May you write holiness upon our hearts that we could honor you and become the people that you want us to become with our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.